have the humility to say, I don't know, and I need help, I think is really powerful. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I'm excited for you to see this brand new episode. I want to say thanks to our partners at AKA for giving us such a great place to stay. When we're in town, sometimes we're filming stories for about a week, and I don't love renting a stranger's house. So it's nice to have a full kitchen, a place to spread out and have our pre-production meetings, and have all the luxuries of a hotel, but still have the comforts of home. So you guys gotta check them out. Anyway, now let's get into our story. Hi, I'm Melanie Whelan, the CEO of SoulCycle, and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. I usually ask my guests, how'd you get this job? So in 2008, um, I lived downtown. I was six months pregnant with my first child. And I have a belief that if you hear about something three times from three different people, you have to try it, whether it's a restaurant or reading a book. I had heard about SoulCycle so many times. We had, at the time, one studio on 72nd Street uptown. And I went up uh, to take class and to try it. And I don't think I'll ever really remember the workout or what happened in the room or the music, but what I remembered was the energy um, and the experience in the lobby of the studio and the hospitality that our co-founders brought to my experience as I checked in was something like I had never seen before. Uh, the next day I got back to my office. I was running business development for Equinox at the time and I received in one of our silver retail bags a onesie that said Soul Child on it and a thank you note, handwritten card from one of our co-founders saying thank you for coming in. And it really struck me that, you know, especially be having been in the fitness industry for five years prior, that what SoulCycle was creating was the sense, not just of a great workout, but of community and hospitality and human connection, right? So long story super short, um, three years later, uh, I was at Equinox at the time, we ended up acquiring a majority interest in the business and I had fallen in love with the model. We had seven studios at the time, all New York based, and I came over as our COO to build and lead and scale our operation. So let's go back in the timeline a little bit, back to when you were a little bit younger. Um, I know you've had hospitality experience and you had the fitness experience, but what did you want to be when you grew up? Like, did you think you would ever end up on this path? What kind of aspirations? Like, did you want to be an athlete or did you want to be in, you know, in music or dance or art? Like, what were your aspirations when you were a kid? So I grew up uh, with a father who was an entrepreneur. And this is in the early 80s when entrepreneurialism wasn't what it is today, yeah. certainly. And I grew up in a household watching a father who worked really hard starting companies, uh, multiple companies over the course of my childhood. And I grew up, they were all client service based companies. And so it was a lot of phone calls when things would go wrong, a lot of over the phone hospitality and saving relationships because he believed that the key to any business is really making sure the customer felt taken care of. So that was sort of part of my DNA as I, as I grew up. Um, but eventually I thought I was going to be an architect. I, I loved uh, math and science and I went to school for engineering and I thought that I would um, get a master's in architecture and hopefully have my own firm. And halfway through college, I was just really bitten with this idea of business and sort of fell out of love with engineering and solving math problems and started to pivot my career in, onto the business side. And I think a lot of that is driven by having had an, a father who's an entrepreneur. Well, I guess you still are building things though, right? Like, so there's still that element in there, right? I can definitely say having been in this business for the last six years and starting with our office in a laundry room down in our Tribeca studio has been, it's been quite a build. Did you ever get, um, you know, feedback from family or friends like on your career path? Like, did they tell you, oh, you know, you're crazy if you're going that direction or you should, you know, stick to the plan and, you know, be an architect or? I think, um, you know, I've always had parents that have been very supportive in exploring what we're passionate about, but they've always pushed us really hard to make sure we're challenging ourselves, A, to live up to our own potential and pushing as hard as we can. Um, I've had great mentors along the way that I think have asked the right questions around the decisions that I've made, primarily through the lens of, are you with great people? Are you learning? And are you having an impact in something that's meaningful to you? And that doesn't mean that every day is going to be you know, full of meaning and, and joy, but that ultimately that we're all working towards something that's bigger and that we're all learning and doing that together. Yeah, I ask that because you know a lot of people who watch this show, I think they're struggling with that. You know, Whatever their age is and wherever they are in their career path, they're always thinking, Am I making the right choice? You know, this feels risky or scary right now. Or what is your advice on, you know, how long do you give this great idea until you 
cut bait or go a different direction, pivot, change whatever you're doing. I, I think that's something I always want to know as well. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I liken this back to when I was at Starwood, you know, out of college. I had taken not the career path that many people had taken, which was going into investment banking or consulting or onto professional school. And I went into something that was more entrepreneurial, I think a lot having to do again with my father, and also because it was hospitality based, which was really interesting to me. And it was an incredible path. I had a wonderful mentor. And then I met a woman who was starting an airline, and I thought, well, that sounds like an incredible experience. I was commuting out to White Plains basically six days a week. This is Virgin? This is Virgin. Yeah. And um, I took the risk. And I took it in a very thoughtful way. Did I believe in the leader? Did I believe in the business? Was it someplace I thought that I could learn and that I could grow? And then was I also putting myself in a position where there was a next step? Was I going to learn enough where I could pivot if it didn't work out? And I yeah. think you have to believe enough, and entrepreneurs especially, I think you have to believe enough. Entrepreneurs, I think, are true visionaries, that they will take that risk and believe in themselves, but then you also, I think, have to have a somewhat introspective approach to know when it's time, and a lot of that, I think, is, is gut. Yeah, I think you make a really good point. I just want to maybe underscore a little bit, because it, it was subtle, to me at least, it sounds like, and I, I agree with you as well, that maybe on the outside looking in, being an entrepreneur seems risky and scary, but the reality is we are, and those in the trenches are, doing everything they can to mitigate risks, right? They're thinking strategically about it, they're, they're doing everything they can up to a certain point with the control to mitigate the risk. It's not like we love risk, right? Like, we want to be successful. What, you know, what intrigues us is the opportunity, right? And so mm -hmm. I think that's a very good lesson for those to remember that, you know, there is a certain amount of due diligence that you can do and a certain amount of planning and preparation before you, you know, if there's a chasm to make it as close as you can so it's not a leap of death, it's more like a little hop. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think one of the things I've learned over the years as well, sometimes we don't spend enough time thinking through the downside and the what ifs. And the more time we can spend, we've got this great vision, we've got a great plan, we're going to make a smart bet on a new initiative, a new program. What are the downsides and where can this go wrong? And making sure you really dig deep and make sure you think through that because invariably something is going to go wrong, right? And the more you do it, the more you learn where those minefields may be. So we just make sure here especially we really think through, always from the rider's perspective, you know, what how might they respond to this in a way that's not favorable? Why might this not live up to their needs? And then how can we course correct? And I think that spending as much time on the opportunity as mitigating the risk is, is important. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, a lot of people do a post-mortem analysis, right? After the fact, but like pre-mortem is super important too. Like try to poke holes in your plan and see what doesn't work ahead of time so you can avoid pitfalls and whatnot. And still doing that post-mortem, right? Because even if you've identified all the downside, the downside that comes might not be any of the downsides that you identified up front. So being really honest with yourself about what failure looks like and being okay if it didn't work out. Do we at least learn some things so we do it better next time? Yeah, so let's talk about the F word a little bit, failure. A lot of people like to brush it under the carpet or don't talk about it. There's some stigma attached apparently the reality is we can't have success without failure. You know, they go together. Um, can you think of any like life lessons, key learnings from missteps, failures? I mean, Oprah says, you know, we we don't fail, we just learn, right? But we so, don't. I either win or I learn, right? Yeah, yeah. I love that framework. Um, so, under that, you know, are there any key learnings that you've had from missteps? Oh, plenty. Um, one I can share that comes to mind quite often is uh, my first real management experience, the first time I was handed a team to run. You know, I came in, you know, I was a young VP, and I came in thinking, oh, I have to bring all this value. I need to, you know, if I, I will have these teams reporting into me. I want to make sure I have a strategic plan. And when you come in with your idea first, I think most times you will always fail, right? Yeah. And the most powerful thing I think a leader can do is really listen to the team around them and really understand what do you think is important? What do you want to be focused on? And then collectively, how are we going to get that done? So I think you know, having failed in that um, in my first management experience, I've learned that over the years that listening I think is a very undervalued leadership tool. For sure. How did you fail then specifically? Did you, were people not receptive or did you, did you get a lot of, you know, <laughs> like, 
new sheriff coming, shooting up the town. Who does she think she is? is it, was it that? I think it was, a, it was a combination of not really building the relationships and so ultimately not being able to have impact. And those two things, you know, we are all here to create impact. And so if you can't forge that relationship by listening and developing that goodwill and that trust, then that person is not going to be able to have the impact or you together will not be able to have the impact. And a lot of it speaks from, I think, both the relationship and the results. Yeah, let's get a little bit reflective here. I'm thinking back to my 20s and early 30s. I mean, in my 20s, I always felt like no one listened to me. Mm -hmm. uh, in my 30s, I finally felt like I was listened to, but like sometimes I had regrets like, oh, I'm too far down the river now that, you know, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not a young buck like I used to be. And, you know, I just had, it was like this, this uh, irony, right, all the time. But now, a little bit further down the stream, I feel like age doesn't matter. I feel like it is all about your approach and you're, you sort of hit right on it like I was thinking about, you know, the listening skill and the people skills. Can you talk about how that's changed from, you know, your 20s and, you know, how that's evolved over time a little bit from your younger experience and now a veteran CEO? So I think practicing active listening is a skill. People, some people are naturally better listeners. but you can train active listening. It's just the art of really hearing what someone is saying, not reflecting on what you want to say in return. And then also recapping back, this is what I heard you say. So there's perfect clarity and there's alignment, right, coming out of a conversation. Um, and I think it's something that, you know, certainly I'm not perfect and something that I am working on every day. Sometimes when you're moving so fast as an entrepreneur, you're like, I know where I want to go. Let's just get it done. I'm just going to put it out there. And you don't make the time to actually have those conversations. But I think you know, we were talking a little bit about this earlier with the pace of change in our culture right now. Good ideas come from everywhere around the business. And it may be the person who's sitting at the front desk of your office who sees the most or the nugget around the next cultural program or the next, for us, rider-facing initiative should come from. And so honing listening as a leadership team and also within the walls of this organization to us is really critical. And I think more businesses you know, should take advantage of the fact that the person closest to the customer or the person for us closest to the rider really has that insight. So it's something that we practice a lot. Again, we're not perfect and we're learning as we go, but I, I think given that pace of change and given this young millennial workforce that is coming up that is so passionate and committed, and that, that's where a lot of these great ideas are coming in. Uh, let's talk about millennials for a second. So um, they get a bad rap, but I think you know everything and nothing has changed. Uh, you know, when I was you know, uh, that age, everyone was complaining that I, my music was too loud and you know, whatever. <laughs> so it's like the same thing, only different, right? So um, are you, how, you know, how, do you, how do you take this company culture and make it you know, known to everyone down you know, from the top to the bottom? How do you get the word out about what you're trying to do? You know, how, how are you getting that message out? So communication is something that's one of our core values. You know, especially as a, you know, close to 90 studio business, we're in 15 markets, we have 2,400 people that work for the company now. Making sure that we've got the right channels of communication is critical. And so there's a handful of tools that we use from town halls to all hands to, uh, we have an intra web around the, the company that we use to get information out. Um, and a whole series of processes that we've put in place over the years to make sure that we are clear on vision, we are clear on projects, and that we're clear on recapping back what we've done, who's done it, and celebrating both the things that have been successful and projects where we could have done a little better, the learning moments, as you said. So what, what, describe the culture here. What's it like? So I think, you know, at, at our heart, just like that first time that I checked in to our 72nd Street studio, we're a culture of hospitality. And that really starts in all of our studio lobbies when you walk in. We want our riders to feel seen and heard and appreciated and acknowledged. And we really take a lot of time and, and put a lot of thought behind cultivating those human relationships. You know, we're all moving so fast right now. We're all tethered to our devices 24 hours a day. I always say SoulCycle is the one place where you're going to come and you're going to put your phone down for 45 minutes and you're not going to be sleeping. There's very few times that you can probably think about in your week where you actually do that. And so that, that notion of hospitality is something that we've invested a lot in over the course of the last six years as we've grown and something that we try in our HQ office as well to really make sure as we are hiring people onto our team that we look much more attitudinally for, are these people that want to be the best part of 
our riders' days the best part of each other's days? Are they glass half full kind of people? Are they solution oriented growth mindset? Um, so we think a lot around behavioral interviewing as much as you know interviewing for experience. Can we talk about active workspace? It's a it's a term that we're using because you know as filmmakers, content creators, editors. Um, we used to sit for hours and hours you know, behind the computer editing and chopping things up. And what I noticed was you know, I started you know, swelling up and my mm -hmm. circulation started being affected. And so we deliberately changed our um, office setup to more of an active workspace. Like we have stand-up desks and people are walking around. We have you know, conference rooms where people can get, get together. We have open spaces. We also have closed spaces. Are you guys thinking about, you know, as I look at the layout of this office, um, are you thinking about an active workspace? How does that work for you guys in the culture? So the, the great thing about SoulCycle is riding is a huge part of our culture. It doesn't mean that when you come to work here you have to be an avid rider. We hire all types. But we really encourage people to ride as part of their routine, whether that's in the morning when they come in, taking a break at lunch. It was really important when we selected our HQ location that we would be able to co-locate a studio here because we really want our teams to be connected to our why, right? To our mission and to our riders. And so you know, when we think about workspace, we think about it first from our field team's perspective and do they have the space that they need to do the work that they need to do, making sure that they've got you know, standing mats behind the desks and things like that, but also that they're able to ride when they're in the studios as part of their experience with us. And here you'll see most people are wearing um, very casual attire, um, often spin tights and sweatshirts, because we want to make sure that this active lifestyle maintain, is maintained as part of their work life too. Excellent. Uh, do you have a routine? Like walk us through, you know, your morning to the evening. Like you have things, set things, a regimen. I'm always curious about CEOs, people in the C-suite. They seem to be very disciplined in some areas. What's your regimen look like? So you're catching me at the end of a week of travel, so I feel regimen-less currently, but um, usually when I'm in town, I am very regimented. I've got two young kids who are up at six o'clock every morning, and so we start our morning in the kitchen talking about what's up for the day, what happened yesterday. Um, I'm a big believer in a good breakfast, and so we do all that together. Do you cook? Uh, poorly, but I'm really good at breakfast. That is my specialty, pancakes. Nice. Um, so we do that. I try to take them to school if I can when I'm in town to make sure that I'm part of that community. And I always say about this business and about my children, you learn more in the lobby of a studio and a school in 20 minutes than you will learn sitting behind your desk all day. So spend time with them there. I try to start my morning in a studio riding as part of you know, what we do. And we've got 20 studios now across New York. So I try to be in the business. And then I'm here for the rest of the day in meetings with a variety of teams about the, all the projects that we're working on. We're opening new markets, working on our 2019 pipeline. Uh, we've got a lot of cool marketing stuff that we are working on with the team. Uh, we're adding to our leadership team right now to focus on some new businesses. And so um, just a lot of time meeting with the teams either in this space or out, you know, walking around the office. So is, is the workout kind of like your way to unplug? Um, and I'm also curious about, you know, there's a lot of books in this office. Um, are you an avid reader? Is that important to you to have like a goal for reading? Or talk, talk to me about how you kind of stay... Um, creative or inspired or I mean CEO is a big job <laughs> there's a you know every job is important but like you know ultimately you're responsible you're next on the chopping block um, so how do you maintain you know like I can see the fitness aspect of it being super important yeah, um, yeah for sure. what are some other things that you do to stay energized to stay motivated to stay creative to you know stay on top of the game yeah for me it's the workout, but um, SoulCycle in particular, and I know this will sound manufactured, it's not. The 45 minutes on the handlebars to truly disconnect. And sometimes I'm listening to the music, sometimes I'm listening to the instructor, and sometimes I'm just in my head, you know, letting the Tetris pieces fall and trying to work through a problem. And for 45 minutes to have that presence on those handlebars in a dark room for me is, is truly very meaningful. Um, I am also a, an avid reader. Um, I like to read about things that are important to me in the business, whether it be um, new channels, new cultures, other, from other leaders that have been there and done it before. Um, but I'm also a big believer in the power of fiction. Um, I read a lot of fiction, and it's the last thing I do every night before I fall asleep uh, for at least 10 minutes to really try to clear my mind and get a good night's rest. Part of it, what goes along, seems to what goes along with being the entrepreneur these days is the hustle. Mm -hmm important but like not at the expense of your health yes uh, so I, I think i think that's right and i i think this idea of 
And being really present and really focused where you are is, I think, where you can create the greatest impact. So if I'm in a meeting, I'm in a meeting, and my phone is down, for the most part. If I'm with my kids, my phone is away. And so if I'm, if I'm going to sleep, I'm going to sleep. And so making sure that, that the things that you're doing, you're doing it really well and with purpose and intention, rather than trying to do 20 things at once. You know, I, I think one of um, the things that I really try to do with the team is let's just get really prioritized around the things that are going to have the biggest impact for the teams, for the culture, and for the business versus trying to boil the ocean and do too many things. And I think that there has been, at least in a lot of the conversations I've had, you know, a real acknowledgement that doing fewer things better um, is a way to create that impact that you want to have. That's great advice. Um, let's talk about transforming retail. Um, because it does sound like from your words that this is a hospitality business that just happens to be built around fitness and cycling and whatnot. Uh, but you're also transforming retail. And we talked a little bit off camera about how things are changing and evolving, how you, know, you used to have to beg to get the meeting and now they're begging you to come take your space. And I've heard just from friends as I've been doing my research that when a soul cycle goes into a certain place, it positively impacts the foot traffic and the vibe just around that area. Like a friend who lives in Brooklyn said, oh, SoulCycle just moved in. And she's like, it's awesome. The quality of people that are there and just like, it's so much more alive and it feels more, I don't know, people who are in shape and, and feeling good about themselves or at least trying to be, there seems to be a positive attitude. So can you talk about transforming retail and kind of your vision for that? Because I think it's important. Yeah, I think, it does really start with the experience, right? It's 45 minutes in a dark room, you've got 60 people moving to the rhythm of the music yeah. and having an instructor who's incredibly inspirational holding the energy of the space and taking you along this journey, right? So you come out of the room into the lobby a better version of yourself. And that's really what we are trying to create. What happens then is those 60 people are in the lobbies of our studios, which are very thoughtfully designed to be contained to forge these what we call natural collisions where relationships start to get built. These communities are born in the lobbies of our studios, and what that does to the retail around us, you want to extend that relationship, right? You want to have a cup of coffee, maybe you want to have a juice, uh, you're going to linger a little bit longer, and you're going to tell your friends because you've had this great experience. And so while our community continues to build, the real estate projects around us have seen the same. And so we are, you know, we've been very thoughtful about as, how we've expanded over the last six years. We are opening somewhere between 12 and 18 studios a year. And we're really thoughtful about which projects that we are going into, what markets that we're going into. And we're making some strategic bets on markets that we think can grow with us. And somewhere our riders are begging us to come and we know we just need, we need to be there. So can you share how you're being thoughtful? Like what, what kind of thoughtfulness is going into it? Is it about like, oh, there's a ton of people, like this is a college town, it's a no-brainer, people will just fall into our stu studio, <laughs> or like, what, what kind of thought was going into it? I wish it were that easy. Listen, the business, um, because the workout is effective and it's safe and it's fun, our demographic spans a very wide range, right? We have teen spins sold out across the country in the afternoons of 14 and 15 year olds who are riding. And then we have riders who are well into their 70s and 80s who've been riding with us for 10 years. And so what that really says is that it's much more about a psychographic than it is a demographic. And that opens up tremendous opportunity for us in terms of where we can take the experience. So what is the mindset of the person? That, is it someone who wants to improve themselves? Like what is the psychographic? It's someone that wants to improve themselves, but not just physically. It's someone who wants to live a better version of their life. It's someone that's community oriented. It's someone that places a value on their time and on their relationships. Um, and it's someone who likes, you know, to have fun, who loves music. Um, and it sounds like that there's probably a lot of people out there who are like that. I'm always surprised by how many people haven't tried SoulCycle before because the workout is completely customizable because it's on a bike and we're in the dark and you've got a resistance knob and we have weights that range from one pound to 10 pounds depending on how hard you want to push yourself. And even if you just sit in a dark room and pedal gently on a bike in the back row and you listen to music for 45 minutes, you're going to feel better about yourself when you leave. It's efficient, it's effective, and it just makes you feel better about yourself. So that, for us, you know, we have a very wide um, psychographic and population of people that are really excited about the brand. So our responsibility is to be very thoughtful about when and how we open to make sure that we are protecting the brand and doing right by the riders that we have and also opening in those markets where we know they're ready for us. Where's the white space, you think, in this, 
you know, you came from Equinox, so you have a lot of fitness experience and, and POV, and now here at this helm. But like, where's the white space, you think? So we've talked about sort of where you have been, where you are now. Let's talk a little bit about the future. Yeah, so today we have 87 studios. Um, we're in 15 markets across North America. We think we have a lot more opportunity for expansion domestically into communities that we're not yet in because we're only in 15 markets. Um, we are also expanding globally next year out of North America and will open in London um, and are very committed to our global expansion plan where we think there is just a tremendous macro trend around healthy living and populations looking for ways not only to better themselves physically but also emotionally and looking for connection, which SoulCycle really does in a world where we are all tethered to our devices all the time. One of the other things that we have been really focused on this year is this notion of off-the-bike programming. You know, our experience is physical, it's musical, and it's emotional, wrapped in sort of this hospitality and community. The bike is the vessel at this moment to create that change and to create that impact for our ridership. But we launched a program earlier this year called Soul Annex, which is all off the bike programming um, because our riders were asking to spend more time with us and to spend more time with each other and to spend more time with our instructors. So now we have um, popped up in Bridgehampton for the summer across from our Soul Cycle studio where you can go and take off the bike classes boot camp, yoga, dance, active recovery classes, and we think there's a, a big white space opportunity there as well. Okay, so then let's go back to brand marketing. How, how are you um, reconciling that you have cycle in your name when you come off the cycle? How do you deal with that? Because I'm sure a lot of people who are trying to build a brand or have a brand now and they want, they're in this lane and they want to widen their lane because it makes sense, uh, and people are clamoring for it, yeah. but how do you reconcile the cycle in the name and not on cycle? So for us, it was really important that this new opportunity have its own brand. And that's why we named it the Soul Annex. So we wanted to make sure there was an acknowledgement that it was part of Soul, which is ultimately the core of what we do, but it was an extension off of the cycle. And so as we start to move into a new category, there will be the base framework of Soul and the brand promise that that brings with us but then an acknowledgement of the different verticals in which we think we can play. That's smart. I think it's a really smart way to do it. So it's built under the umbrella of soul, and then you have all these extensions or iterations, and it gives you a lot of flexibility. What keeps you up at night? Like, what, what, are, you, what are you struggling with now? Or I'm sure they're all challenges and fun, and, but like, what, what's really keeping you up at night? You know, the heart and soul of this business is people. It's our teams. You know, we are delivering a live experience every hour on the hour in 87 locations. We produce over 550 classes a day. Those experiences are brought to you by incredible front desk staff, studio managers, regional managers, our instructors who are leading our riders through these experiences and developing these relationships. And so galvanizing that group and continuing to deliver our promise to them, which is giving them a great employee experience, making SoulCycle a great place to spend your time, um, is what I spend the most time thinking about. Um, and it's hard to do with 2,400 people every day. Um, but I think that's where a lot of the transparency around the business and communication um, around the business is so important so that people really understand the why. I think sometimes when you're growing quickly and the brand becomes big when it started so small, we can lose the why. And so constantly beating the drum on, we want to be the best part of our riders' days, we want to be the best part of our riders' days, helps bring people back to make sure that they, they're aligned with our mission. So do you think entrepreneurs are born, or is it something that we can learn? Born, is it born or made? That's a really great question. I think it can be, I think it's both. I think there are entrepreneurs, they just come out and you know that that is what they're going to be. I have a good feeling about my eight-year-old. He is an entrepreneur, happier hustling in a lemonade stand than he is sitting in math class, that's for sure. But I also think some people get the bug later in life as they're exposed to new experiences and they you know, have that belief in themselves that they have an idea and can go after it. So I, I, think, I think it can be both. If we could just go to fantasy world for a second and if you could um, <laughs> trade jobs with another CEO at another brand, Ooh. And it was like the, you know, that, what is it, family swap or wife swap, that yeah. show. If you could do CEO swap, um, what other brand would you jump into for a couple of weeks and then let someone feel like walking in your shoes here? Where would you go? That's a great question. So something that's very top of mind for me right now is this notion of global expansion. 
We have been scaling domestically. Uh, we understand this market. Uh, I think we know who our riders are. And moving into London, you know, it's a, it's a new country. It's a new, very new time zone for us. Um, and there's new business practices. And so I think if I were going to, if, if I get to go and come back, because let's be clear, I love this job. If I'm going for two weeks, I would want to go into a company that is scaled globally successfully and a company that is, like ours, experiential um, with a field-based organization and really learn how they did it. I mean, I look at you know companies like Starbucks and what they've done and how they've taken that brand global and they still have such a strong ethos and clarity of purpose. You know, I, I admire them deeply, and so maybe I would go there. Isn't it interesting that kind of no matter where you go, if you look at some of the key characteristics or traits of success, it all boils down to it's a human business. You know, whether you're flipping burgers, making coffee, riding cycles, or whatever it is, it's still all about people. I think that's right. I think that's right. Okay, final thoughts, um, advice to maybe uh, 18, 19 year old Melanie. Uh, if we're here in today's terms, what advice would you give her about being successful and pursuing her passion and living the dream? Listen more and listen better. I think my young self thought I had a path that I was supposed to follow. You know, I think we're all raised with this grade one goes to grade two, grade two goes to grade three, and that can really set you on a path of shoulds. I should do this versus I could do. And so to really listen deeply to yourself and where you think you want to learn and where you want to place your time, but also listen to other people around you. I think sometimes we also come out thinking we know it all or we're supposed to know it all. And to have the humility to say, I don't know and I need help, I think it's really powerful. Mm -hmm.